What's up, everybody? Welcome to the Thanksgiving edition of Center for Center Files. I'm just going to jump into this one because, look, it's, it's a challenging day. You know, it's holiday time, family time, stuff like that. I've got some uh, family members in the hospital today, so we're going to go visit. Before we do that, we're going to get into this video. Today, we're going to talk about um, The World's Not Enough. I spent some time, put it on last night, and I watched it and I remember how awesome the movie is. It was gangster. So it is the what nineteenth film in the series. This is the uh, actually this year just celebrated its twentieth anniversary. I remember I was sixteen when it came out. I saw it on November nineteenth, nineteen ninety nine when it came out. And that day was also homecoming. So you gotta go to the dance and you gotta look smooth like James Bond. So that's that's what the day was. And every time I watch it, it reminds me of how awesome the movie is. It's actually stands up out as still what 24 movies in as probably one of the more unique entries in the series um, for a lot of reasons so what's the movie about this is the this is Pierce Brosnan's third outing as the character and he is investigating the death of uh, an MI6 agent and that's his way in turns out there's a whole plot with um, oil and the pipeline and how um, uh, Electric King, who's the daughter of an oil tycoon, is wrapped up in this uh, sort of conspiracy to um, make sure that she gets to keep the, the oil that her family uh, uh, found. But it's actually a lot more sinister than that. This film is, is um, uh, I think, the one of the stronger uh, outings in Pierce Brosnan's sort of in his time as the character they only had uh, out of the four films it, it is one of the more unique ones um, if for no other reason than the fact that it's I've mentioned this in the previous video about how uh, you're surprised by who the actual the villain actually is and uh, Elektra is a formidable situation and if you're not ready for her um, you, you've got some you got some problems uh, going on. It's a serious, serious situation. She's, <laughs> uh, but he, he, it, the film throws you off very well with um, uh, Renard. He's uh, the expected type of villain that you that you would get in a film like this. Um, so already off the top, you there's a lot of um, misdirection, and that's how the film gets you. You think it's one type of Bond film, but it is actually it's, it's not. The other thing that keeps that makes this film stand out is Bond's relationship with um, M. It's probably one of the prior to what happens in the Daniel Craig films. It's the most uh, sort of intimate and the most uh, there are deeper layers being explored between the two of them. A lot of the stuff is not spoken. You know, there are spaces where you know uh, Bond confronts M about decisions she's made, and she's got a tough job as the head of a of a secret service agency she's got to make some some decisions that are questionable and um, really the only person can, who can who can call her on that um, is Bond not without you know it, it's not like that it's easy but you get a little bit of that you get to see M outside of the safety of, of MI6 and what that means when her life is threatened and how Bond has to react in that instance you get to see um, you know a lot of you know some more more sensitivity from from Pierce Brosnan's Bond as, uh, as a solid, you know, another precursor to what you get with uh, Daniel, Daniel Craig's Bond. Although he seems a little bit more, there's more edge going on, but the, 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 the element of how Pierce Brosnan plays him makes him much more uh, uh, human than what you've seen, and particularly with uh, the, the Sean Connery and Roger Moore Bonds. Uh, uh, you get elements of that. You know, there's been Audiences has been, you know, wishy-washy and whether or not they're okay with a with a more sensitive bond. But I think prior to Daniel Craig, uh, Chris Brosnan um, was that. And then and and uh, um, and you have some some traces of that with Timothy Dalton, but he's definitely had some more edge as well. But this film deepens that. Whatever you get in um, Tomorrow Never Dies, in some respects with Goldeneye too, it really it comes. It, it's more. I think it's probably the most sort of. Um, uh, warm bond you get in Pierce Brosnan's uh, from Pierce Brosnan's uh, situation 
Uh, so it's a, it's definitely sets itself apart. As a as a Bond film, it's got all the all the right ingredients. You got all the the beautiful women. You got the cars, some great toys, and um, I don't know what you uh, great locations. Though that's all. You, that's the recipe for uh, you know a, a pretty stellar Bond film. And the opening sequence is probably one of the, still one of the strongest ones of all the films. I think um, Spectre has a really good one as well. Uh, but as far as like top ones, it's definitely probably in the top, top tier um, Bond openings uh, as far as those go. And at the time too, like it been, was the first one to really have something that directly tied into the main story. Uh, uh, and it was the longest one at the time. It was, it was like I think 19 minutes or whatever. It was a super long, um, uh, which is long for, for, for uh, uh, pre-title sequences, like the, the, the gun barrel sequence and, and on long for, for, for Bond uh, and it's it, it's great it's also the other reason this film is 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 sort of a, a, a special one it's it's the last appearance of Q it's Des Desmond Lillian's, Lillian's last uh, film um, there was talk about I remember uh, whether or not he would actually retire um, no one um, obviously no one could plan for, for his, his, his passing um, uh, in, in a car accident no less which is the, the makes it harder, but I think you got a sound replacement in um, uh, John Cleese's uh, um, character as the Cleese assistant. But that's that's another reason why the film stands out. You got a really good, nice interaction between Q and Bond, and it almost feels like there's like a uh, and it's a, it's a proper send off really for 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 Q and their dynamic. Really, it's, it's you know there's a nice sort of father son uh, element in that. Or, you know, uncle, nephew type, you know, Bond is like the, you know, cavalier nephew in, in the midst of all that. Um, but um, it's, uh, it's, it's potent, their exchange, and you, you need that for, for the, I think you, well, I think you need it for this film. It's got some great action. That boat chase is great. The, the can ski sequence, this is awesome. That's the other thing. Let's talk about skiing for a second. Is, is something crucial in, in the Bond films. They, I think you, you... You know, you try to figure out how many. There, not a lot of Bonds have had that experience. I mean, Roger Moore's done it a few times. He has skiing and whatever in three, three films, and Chris Brosnan has one good. This is his, this is his solid uh, skiing situation, and it's very well shot. Even before the actual chase starts, it's beautifully shot. It's, it's nice, nice tracking shots. A really nice sort of establishing shots of the area and the Alps or wherever they are and skiing and stuff. It's like serious. That's good. And then it's got some, you know, just uh, it's, got, it's got a great action sequence at the at the um, sort of caviar factory. That's another one. And just it's a, it's a it's a it's a good situation all around. The only thing I, I had a, a, um, a little bit of an issue with was the setup with um, Renard. Renard is a, he's he's set up as an amazing villain. He's here's a guy who has no. Um, he, he's losing his senses. He's got the bullet stuck in his head. He can't feel any pain. He can't, you know, he's losing t taste, touch, and all these different things. These sensations are losing. That the the fact that he can't feel pain though is that that's a setup for a really good uh, confrontation. And the disappointment comes in is that the confrontation is not all that. Um, it's it doesn't match up with how Renard was set up. And so that's a little bit of a letdown. When they fight, um, you know, you want it to be. Like a real, like a like a fight. Like it's gonna be really hard for Bond to win that fight. And you know, I think to be fair, he, Bond does struggle, and it doesn't feel like it's a it's a, a challenge. But it doesn't it um it doesn't feel like it lives lives up to what we were at least for me what I was expecting from uh, from uh, Renard. But aside from that, um, I think the misdirection element is great. It's a it's a it's a true standalone in in the way in how it deals with how it handles. Um, its characters, particularly Electric King, Christmas Jones, uh, Denise Richards' uh, uh, portrayal of Christmas Jones is another. Uh, I don't know, questionable element. I think they just had her in there obviously because she's really attractive, and um, and to be this is true. This is you know she just had she just done uh, Wild Things. I think you know a year, a couple years before that. Um, so it's um, uh, it's not surprising that she's in the film. It just some parts of it feel like she she wouldn't fit for the film, 
but she, you know, she she does she does what she can, and I think that that's not her fault. This is part of it. It's a, it's just the nature of whatever it is. I just I um I don't know. As far as Bond girls go, um, uh, um, Christmas Jones the character doesn't feel super memorable, and that's just you know part of that's probably the script a little bit, and part of it is just how she was trying to how she delivered the lines and stuff. Not you know. Whatever. Clearly, this is that's just the. Sometimes it happens um, with Bond films, but the real draw, uh, you know, Sophie, Sophie Marceau is amazing as uh, Electric King. She plays so many layers. And it's really probably by far one of the more rich um, women in the Bond sort of pantheon of all, of all the films. Right up there with um, uh, uh, Pussy Galore and um, Fiona from Thunderball. Uh, they don't have as much layering, though. I mean, they're great female characters, femme fatales, whatever, in that in that way. Um, but um, Sophie Marceau really takes it uh, far. She's rich and just just she's she's angry. She's um, she's charming. She's got all these different things that could you could really. Um, it, it's easy to get caught up, and when you you, you find out different things about her, um, you're, it's like, oh, okay, well, this, that's, that's me messed up, you got, <laughs> but she, that, that just shows how good she is as a, as an actor, but also how she portrayed Electra in the same way, very, uh, calculating, very, um, uh, just, and, and, and quite, and manipulative too, and, and very smart. She knew exactly what she was doing. She knew she she had a good yeah good good situation going on with that. Um, the direction of the film is sound. I think the acting is good. The action is great as a as a Bond film. It definitely it's, it's one of the one of my uh, uh, I one of the ones I enjoy. Well, I for, I preface that by saying so. Pierce Brosnan is the Bond that I came of age. Uh, um, the time during his during his tenure, I was I was I came of age during his time as Bond. So he's, for many reasons, he'll be he'll be my Bond just 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 because just for that for that reason. When I started really getting back into Bond, uh, it was through Pierce Brosnan and then exploring some of the older films that I hadn't seen um, uh, before that. So th so he's I'm always going to have soft spot for Pierce. For Pierce. Uh, and having said that, um, we're looking critically. I I've mentioned this also in the previous video how each Bond has a uh, sort of prime bond situation and um for me it's hard it's i for real it's probably going to be this film the, the world's not enough is probably pierce brosnan's prime bond film um uh, tomorrow never dies it's it, it's close because that's just i and i say that just because that's that's the first film that i've seen that i saw in theaters first one from saw in theaters and it was uh i didn't know the video on that but that's i also like that film but the world's not enough we're looking at prime situations um uh, it's probably going to be where Chris Brosnan is. That's his, his the peak uh, space of, 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 of Bond for him, uh, in my 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 view. The other thing about that film was amazing is the music. So David Arnold is was I think is the spiritual successor to John Barry, with uh, with the what he did with the with the Bond music. He he, he really understood um, the sort of the the mechanics and sort of the nuances of of employing. Whatever the technology is at the time to produce music, with the orchestral elements and sort of some of the um, um, sort of more traditional brass and different things that are in the spirit of John Barry, but very much now or in, you know at the at, uh, in the time very like Bond of the, as a character who is is of the time he's 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 a part of a different time, but he is very much of the time. That he's living in, also he very he's always updated to fit whatever the time is, but not so much that it he's losing whatever his um, his core character uh, things are, and I think the music reflects that. Um, John John Barry he had scored what I think eleven Bond films, and each one across you know over across various decades, and across like three different Bonds, uh, he's had the 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 opportunity for Bonds. To, to change the sound based on the time 
like whatever the years it were was and whoever the person was, was inhabiting the role. Uh, and um, uh, one of his strongest scores, I think, relative to what we're talking about with David Arnold, is probably The Living Daylights. I think A View to a Kill is, is, a, is, a, is, a, is, a, is a close, is in that mix too. But John Barry's done a lot of amazing music. Goldfinger and, you know, whatever, all those Times Are Forever, like just tons of different things with the music. Um, Majesty, or Majesty Service is another killer one. I think that's um, a part of uh, this conversation with David, David Arnold, because he did some of the exact same things with Tomorrow Never Dies, Stores Not Enough, Dunder the Day, and then he reinvented that with Casino Royale, sort of remixed some of the same themes, and then Quantum Solace. You know, I think he really he's he's the the, the closest thing to the like the like the true successor to John Barry in maintaining some of the traditional elements while, while keeping it fresh and updated. And, and the World's Not Enough is probably uh, the one of the stronger scores in the post John Barry uh, situation. Um, that just all the elements of music, even the shorter pieces of music are just really beautifully composed. Uh, he does really cool, fun stuff with the Bond theme. Uh, I've always liked his his um, take on the James Bond theme. You have to, you can't mess that up. You got you got to get that has to be right, and he has to, it has to be in a, enough to make it feel like a Bond film, which is one of my my biggest complaints about some of the newer films, the Daniel Craig films, particularly um, uh, Spectre. Uh, and a little bit in Skyfall. Skyfall actually had a little bit in there, so you just oh, this is my film. But but, but um, Spectre didn't. Really, it felt like Newman, Thomas Newman, did. It almost felt like a different action movie. And I wanted more instances of the Bond theme because uh, it's the Bond film. You need to have at least like a two or three sequences in the film where you where you punctuate those those moments with Bond music elementy things and. Uh, there are certainly things that felt like they could have been in the Bond film, but the Bond theme itself didn't feel like it made an appearance as much. And I think that's a, that's a, almost it's, it's music is a big part of any movie. But in a Bond film, you, things have to feel like a, like a Bond situation, and there's nowhere more apparent when that happens. Aside of the girls and the guns and the locations, you don't really have that without the music and like the Bond music, the certain motifs, the certain notes that you know. Once you hear them, it's a that's you know what that means. And The World Is Not Enough is, is a great example of that. There are at least sort of, at least, two, at least two for sure moments where the theme is used and remixed and done all kinds of crazy. Plus there's, there's, there's motifs within that that are, to me, feel like um, Pierce Brosnan's, like Pierce Brosnan's last three films from Tomorrow Never Dies, The World Is Not Enough, and Die Another Day feel like they are a sort of unofficial trilogy. Um, musically, and that's because David Arnold scored those three films. There are pieces in the music for each of those films that appear in all those three films, like certain notes that began in Tomorrow Never Dies, continue in The World Is Not Enough, also make their way in different ways in Dying of the Day, which is cool. And it, it to me, also connects Pierce Brosnan's Bond as the same guy who's done, like, literally, I mean, Bond is supposed to be this continuous situation, but it feels like, really, he's... And that's the same dude who's, who's gone on these different missions and and had these different more more complex nuanced relationships with people in his camp, um, particularly M. You start getting more depth between the two of them, and and, and just other areas of you know sensitivity and things that come from that come from Pierce Brosnan. Um, one last thing I'll note before I, I close this video that I think this is that was really cool is that that ties Pierce Brosnan's bond spiritually to. Um, sort of history of Bond as a character is the line, uh, Electra, when they first meet, she asks him about um, whether or not he's lost a loved one. Obviously, this is immediately following the death of her father. Uh, he's come, he's meeting her, meeting her officially for the first time after uh, after the funeral. And Bond doesn't answer that question. He sidesteps that and talks about why he's there. And that's a, it's a little moment that I don't know that a lot of people pick up pick up on, but. For me, it says this. This is a guy who still has sensitivities. If you've watched any of the Bond films, if you follow, you know, from the beginning, you know he has lost someone um, he he loved. Um, he's lost many people he's cared about. <laughs> um, but there's one person, or you know, one per up to that point. This is not in you know, excluding Casino Royale, but this is, you know, after all of that, there's at least one person for sure that you could think of. Namely, that's his, his wife, who was murdered on their wedding day. That's a major thing for the character. 
And the fact that he doesn't answer that is, first of all, I mean, on one, point, on one hand, it's like, well, why would you answer that? Like, I just met you really today. I'm not going to, that doesn't matter. That's not why I'm, I'm not here to talk to you about that. I'm here to do this. That's one thing. Two is why would she ask that question? You can understand. I mean, look, someone, you know, you, maybe you, you, you might ask that question if you lost somebody. You know, it just seems like an odd thing to ask the first time you meet somebody. But that's also Electra doing some work. She's trying to she's trying to figure out what's going on with this dude because she knows she you know, she's has she has a plan for things that are going to be happening beyond that moment. So there's there's probably some some reason for that. But I thought it was a great character moment for for Bond. Um, uh, if you had if you didn't know that, that's one of those things like oh that's you you really sense this guy really and it's, especially if you've seen you know right after Tomorrow Never Dies you know he lost someone else. You, it could it could be referring to Paris. That was someone who also he he loved. Or he could be referring to his wife. I took it as his wife, because that's just, you know, his... But it could be very well be Paris. This is this is the next film immediately following that, and it's, it's very likely that that's who she's talking about. But, um, anyway, um, that's... Well, I have to say about that. Tomorrow Never, Tomorrow Never Dies is good, but The World Is Not Enough is probably, critically, a stronger film. If I'm rating it, I'm giving it probably about, oh, an 8 out of 10. Um, yeah, give me an 8 out of 10. Uh, it's a fun film, and uh, as far as Bond films go, it's a, it's a good one, for sure. And we're going to be getting into more of Bond stuff uh, at some point really soon. I'm not sure if it's going to be the next video or it'll be one after that, but because we're still in November, which um, for my feeling, I get the, this, every November I, I get into the mood and watch at least one Bond film. I can't get out of the month without watching, I try to anyway, especially on Thanksgiving. Um, if you recall the 13 days of Thanksgiving situation, I think 13 days of 007, which used to happen on Thanksgiving time, around that time leading up to the day, so this is, this is that kind of, that kind of, uh, this is the time. So, before we get out of the month, maybe I'll have another video up about Bond, maybe I won't. But, we'll see. Anyway, if you've stuck around this long, thank you for watching this video. And I know there's a ton of other things out there you could be watching, could be doing. Um, especially on Thanksgiving, you're probably, hopefully you're all enjoying uh, time with your families. Uh, and I will close this video and be able to do, and begin to get myself together to spend time with my family. So, um, if, you, if you're still here, thank you. Uh, and I'll be back later with some, uh, some more videos. You have a good, have a good Thanksgiving. And I'll see you later. Out.